Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to Ask the Expert. Today, we'll be learning all about pie baking just in time for the holidays with expert Sarah Belial. I'm Gina Veramo, GBH host by day and baking enthusiast by nights and weekends. So thank you to everyone that's joined us today, including our Leadership Circle and Ralph Wool Society members. We appreciate your continued generous support. Before we get started, I would just like to give you a friendly reminder that unlike us, we can't see or hear you, but that does not mean that you will not be involved in the conversation. We want to know all of your questions, as this conversation will really be driven by you and what you want to know. So if you have a question that you want to ask our expert, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type it in. And as always, we would love to know where you're watching from. So when you put in your question, let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, you can give it a thumbs up and those will automatically be moved to the top of the Q&A and we'll be sure to answer those questions first. If you'd like, you can also watch this event with closed captioning. So to turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcript display options will pop up and we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning on the bottom of your screen. If you'd like, you can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Um, please bear in mind that the closed captioning might be slightly delayed. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Belial. After graduating from the Culinary Institute of America with degrees in baking and pastry arts and food service management, uh, Sarah began her pastry career working for the world famous Magnolia Bakery in New York City. For a number of years, she baked, cake decorated, and managed for Magnolia before making the move to Boston. Here in Massachusetts, Sarah worked for Joanne Chang at Flower Bakery and Cafe as their pastry training manager, overseeing the training of all bakers and cake decorators for the company. After some time, Magnolia planned to open their first Boston location, and she was fortunate enough to run it as their general manager for two years in historic Daniel Hall in 2019. Sarah had the opportunity to compete on the Food Network's Holiday Baking Championship season six and made it all the way to the finale. After the unfortunate closing of Magnolia Bakery due to the pandemic, she began working for Union Square Donuts as their head of culinary production. And she's been living happily ever after in donut heaven. And as someone that lived right next to Union Square Donuts for seven years, yes, it truly is donut heaven. So Sarah, thank you for joining us. Welcome. And Thank you. I'd love to start at the bottom. So the foundation of pies, the crust. Yes. So over the last few weeks, you know, scrolling through Instagram, I've been seeing a <laughs> lot of different recipes floating around, some with butter, some with shortening, some with a mix of both. Do you have a go-to recipe that you like to use? Sure. So my go-to pie recipe is a three, two, one pie dough. So a lot of times with baking, everything is a ratio. Um, with pie dough, I do three, two, one, three parts flour, two parts fat, and one part water. Um, oh. As far as the flour goes, um, you can definitely interchange if you wanted to mix in some nut flours, um, whole wheat flour, anything like that. And then as far as fat goes, you can do butter, shortening, lard, the fat of your choice. Um, and a lot of people do choose to mix it up, do half shortening, half butter, that kind of thing. Um, so that way you get the flakiness and the layers of the shortening, but you also get that delicious buttery flavor from the butter. Mm, yeah. So when you're talking about your recipe, I do hear that you mentioned water and I have seen a lot of pie recipes that call for vodka and replace instead of water. What's the, what's the difference between the two? Sure. So um, they're pretty much interchangeable. A lot of people think the vodka, um, because it evaporates faster with the alcohol, um, it gives a little bit more flakiness layers to the crust. I've, I've mm -hmm. definitely tried both and both work great. As long as you keep all of your ingredients cold, 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 cold. That's the most important key. Mm, yeah, that is super important to make sure all that butter doesn't melt. And yeah, everything's nice and solid. Yeah. So so that's an important part, chilling your pie dough. Do you have a recommendation for how long folks should chill their pie dough? I've seen anywhere from like, you know, you can roll it out after an hour or two. You can make your pie dough like three days ahead of time. Do you have a like a sweet spot? Um, so usually I do an hour. Um, I'll make the pie dough, chill it, um, you know, get going on my sweet potato casserole, you know, baste my turkey a little bit in between um, and then go back to my pie dough. 
uh, as far as keeping it cold too. So I always use ice water when I add my water mm. in there. Um, and I literally put ice into my water and then scoop the ice out first thing. And then, you know, tablespoon by tablespoon, add the water. It's really important to get all of the ice cubes out ahead of time though, because if you get one of those little stinkers into your dough, it's going to have a little hole in your pie and nobody wants that. Um, so yeah, so if you keep your water cold, your butter cold, um, it'll make the pie dough so much easier to refrigerate and get it nice and cold and ready to roll for when you're ready to go in. And then another little tip that I love to do is um, after I make my crust, after I shape it, after I make all my little fancy things to go with it, mm -hmm. um, I pop it in the freezer. I get that sucker as cold as I possibly can, oh. fill it, and then throw it into the hot oven. Nice. So I, I hear you say you fill it and then throw it into the oven, which brings mm -hmm. me to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is you've made your crust, chilled it, you rolled it out, you've crimped, it's beautiful. <laughs> when does it make sense to pre-bake your crust? Are there certain pies where pre-baking makes the most sense versus you know throwing everything in raw? So if I'm going to pre-bake, fully pre-bake, it would be for some sort of pie that would have a refrigerated filling, like a cream pie. Mm -hmm. I would bake mm -hmm. the pie crust all the way through. Um, I would par bake or partially bake the, the crust um, if I was going to do a very liquidy pie. I usually like to par bake my apple pie um, just because there's so much liquid in there. You don't want the bottom crust to be soggy. Um, so I would par bake anything that has a lot of liquid in the filling, um, but pre-bake, completely bake your crust if it, you're making um, a chocolate cream pie or a coconut cream pie, something like that. Yes, I uh, just made an apple pie recently and I did not pre-bake the crust or mm -hmm. par, -ba par bake. And I had the dreaded soggy bottom that if anybody is a great British baking show fan, uh, <laughs> like I am, you're very familiar with the soggy bottom. Yep. <laughs> um, and that's what happened. So par baking is usually what avoids the soggy bottom. Are there any other? Yes. I've also seen folks say you could um, do a little egg wash and sometimes that will stop the soggy bottom? Are there any other tips or is par baking like the number one thing to keep in mind? I would definitely say par baking is my number one thing to keep in mind. Um, you can also dack your dough, um, which means once you put your crust in your pie pan, um, you can get a fork or like a paring knife and then poke the sides of it so that um, the steam can release. Um, this also helps to prevent like big bubbles and stuff in your crust if you have like those beautiful butter layers. Um, yeah. When your butter is very cold and then you put your pie into a hot oven, it creates steam, which gives you those beautiful layers. Um, so docking just kind of helps to avoid the big bubbles. Um, and it also helps you, uh, you know, get that heat evenly dispersed and stuff. Another thing that's kind of like a secret I like to do is I always Ooh, bake my nice. apple pie in a glass pie dish. Um, so when you take the pie out of the oven to check it, you can literally hold the pie dish up and see if the bottom has that golden brown color. If it's mm. still very blonde um, or very light, you know it's not done yet. Yeah, there's certain, I have actually seen, I'm, a, I'm an America's Test Kitchen geek. Um, yep. <laughs> and they always say, you know, um, like an aluminum pan is better for sticky buns where, you know, a casserole mm. dish is better for this versus, you know, a, another medium like a ceramic. Mm. Um, when you're baking a pie, it, do you feel like, there's one medium over the other that makes more sense. Can, is a glass pie dish, you know, great for everything? Do you have a preference? Um, not so much the material that it's in, whether it's ceramic or glass. Um, I find that they're all kind of similar, but I will say that a lot of the times people will put a baking sheet under their pie to kind of yes. catch any oozing. And although that's brilliant to keep your oven clean, um, that added barrier also stops the heat from getting to your bottom and can lead to some underdone bottom crust. So what I do is I'll put the pie in the middle rack of my oven and then I'll put the sheet tray right below it on the next rack so that it still catches all the drippage, but that pie um, has more heat you know, readily available to the bottom. That's so smart. Yeah. I, I never even thought of that. That's a great idea because I always want to spare the bottom of my <laughs> oven because then, you know, right. it burns, like it burns, the smoke right. alarm goes off. Actually, exactly. <laughs> I was, the last time I baked a pie, I made an apple pie for my husband's birthday and mm -hmm. at eight in the morning, the smoke alarm went off because, yeah. 
the <laughs> the juices dripped over and burnt on the bottom of the oven. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he came out of the room very confused and I said, Happy birthday, honey. <laughs> so <thanks for> that. <laughs> Here's a pie in an oven for you to clean. Thanks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So um I see we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in. This is oh, awesome. great. Um, great. keep dropping them in the QA. So uh, I want to get to a couple of them uh right now. So our first question is from Sarah Jenkins. She's checking in from Woodlands, Texas. She Great. says, I pile fruit high when I make a pie, but it seems like it always shrinks or cooks down more than I hoped. And I end up with a shrunken filling. How can she avoid that? So I do the same thing. Um, I really want to load that thing in the, the fruit in there. What I usually do, especially with my apple pie, um, is I use a mandolin so that I get nice, even um, thin slices of the apples. And then I pile them even higher than I want to. So I anticipate the shrinkage. So if you're doing something like blueberry, which really shrinks down quite a bit, overfill that pie as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And when you roll your top crust, um, roll it out a little wider than you would think to fit over that mountain right. of fruit. Um, all fruit, because it's just, it's so full of all of those delicious juices is going to shrink down. But overcompensating by putting even more in there will will help you still have a nice full pie even after the fruit shrinks a little bit mm, yeah that's a that's a great point we've all made that pie where it shrinks and you have like a like two inch yeah. gap between like <laughs> yeah. where the crust and the filling is <laughs> yeah yeah that's when you put the ice cream on top and the ice cream goes in the hole <laughs> yes perfect okay yeah. um sherry gray would let your sherry gay would like to know and this is a great question um, mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for making a gluten-free pie crust? Ooh, um, so a lot of the times when I've done gluten-free baking, um, I think people get really intimidated with all of the different things out there, the rice flour, the potato right. starch, the guar gum, the blah, 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 this. Um, and honestly, take any pie crust recipe that you have and buy cup for cup. Um, King Arthur has a really good one. Um, Bob's Red Mill has a good one. Um, and it's literally just a flour replacer. So if your pie crust recipe calls for one cup of flour, just use one cup of this cup for cup replacement. Um, and it's great. This cup for cup um, mixture that they've, they've made of the rice flour, of the potato starch, of the guar gum um, is exactly supposed to mimic an all purpose flour. Um, and it's always worked great for me. Mm, great. Um... We have a question from Chris Santos from Brookline, and she would like to know if you don't have pie weights or dried beans, what do you suggest using for pre-baking your crust? Mm. Um, so definitely when you put, you know, any sort of thing, pie weights, beans, um, use baking, like a baking parchment paper instead yeah. of aluminum foil to line because the aluminum foil sticks. Um, dried beans are a great replacement if you don't have pie weights. A lot of the time they're expensive. You know, why waste yeah, the money? Just get some dried beans. Expensive. Yeah. Um, I like to use rice sometimes. Mm. Um, I've used literally anything I can find in the kitchen that would not burn or something in the, in the oven as I'm, as I'm baking it. Um, dried beans, rice. Um, I've even used some parchment paper and then I have another pie dish, um, that I've used on top. A lot of the times I would do that half the time and then I take the pie crust just so I can get some heat in there. But um, rice, dried beans, dried lentils, anything like that. Yeah. And for folks that may not know why you're putting the pie weights of the dried beans in there, could we like take a step back and talk about why you add that weight and, and sure. what the process is like? Yes, absolutely. So um, as I was saying before, with the with the butter and the shortening in your pie crust, that's nice and cold. Um, when baking a pie at a high temperature, it creates steam, which gives you right. those beautiful layers in the pie, um, which you want. Uh, however, you don't want it to fill up the, the vessel of your pie. You know, you want your pie to still hold filling. Mm -hmm. um, so by par baking your pie and putting a piece of parchment and putting those baking beans or the little baking um, weights in there, you kind of press down the pie to keep the, the crevice intact so that you can still put a good amount of filling in your pie, um, but it just helps to bake the sides and the bottom a little bit, um, get them strong enough to hold all of your filling, um, and it'll help you make sure that that's um, cooked all the way through by the time your pie is done. Yeah, 
Perfect. And, and it's also like, it may feel intimidating. It's super easy to do. And yes. it does make a very big difference. So. Yes. And it's really, you know, you could do something like 375 or 350 just for 10 to 15 minutes and it'll, it'll save your pie. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, we have another question from Jack Coleman. Wow. Y'all have so many questions. This is so fantastic. Great. Um, have you had any successes in assembling a pie like an apple pie ahead of time without baking it? So freezing it for a day or two and then baking it. Um, I found that it gets a little weird if you put the filling into the crust, if the crust is still raw. Um, I've definitely made crusts and frozen crusts ahead of time, made my filling and, um, you know, saran wrap that, put that in my fridge ahead of time. But I recommend filling right before it goes in the oven. Um, if you can keep them a little bit separate, it'll keep that dough from kind of absorbing all of the right. apple juice and the lemon juice and the sugars and stuff that your filling is going to have. So by all means, make your crust ahead of time. I usually make four a couple weeks before Thanksgiving, pop them in my mm -hmm. freezer, and then all the work is done. Um, and then, yeah, of course, those, uh, the fillings you can make ahead of time, just if you're doing apple, remember to put that lemon juice on there because you don't want brown apples. Yes. 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 <laughs> so when you're talking about, you know, a lot of times you'll put, you know, the citrus and the sugar to, mm -hmm. you know, like macerate and, you know, get all those lovely things happening. Um, is there, are there any fruits that you wouldn't want to make too far ahead of time? Like I imagine like a peach might like completely decomp like come apart too much, or can you really use like any fruit or filling and make ahead of time? Um, so peaches do get a little, they brown a lot as well, yeah. like apples. Um, they get brown and they get kind of mushy. Like you were saying, um, blueberries totally hold up fine. Um, even I find sometimes with I'm doing, when I'm doing like a strawberry rhubarb, um, and they're macerating and all of those juices and sugar, it does pull a lot of the liquid out. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think as long as you are good about mixing it before you put it into your crust. Um, and even if you sprinkle a little bit of flour on the bottom of your crust before you put the filling mm. in, some of that extra flour will help absorb. Too. Yeah. And I've actually seen a couple weird recipes where they put cereal on the bottom of the cake, like some corn flakes or frosted flakes on the bottom of the pie crust. And then the cereal absorbs the extra liquid as well. And I was like, how delicious. Uh, that might be just like super fun texture bomb. Yeah. Too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, excellent. So, uh, one other thing about freezing ahead of time, um, when you freeze your dough, do you usually freeze it like saran wrap or can you freeze it like already rolled out in your pie dish? So I roll it out, I crimp it. Um, and then I just put some parchment papers in between the, the pies cause I'm doing multiple pies at a time right. and I just throw them in, I throw them in the freezer. Mm -hmm. I mean, just for a couple of days, I think if, if you were going to do them you know, a couple of weeks at a time, I'd saran wrap it just to avoid some freezer burn, but a right. couple of days you're fine. Oh, that's yeah, fun. Beautiful. Yep. I love having a ready to go pie crust at all times. You never know <sighs> who's coming over. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Michelle would like to know, um, how long do you par bake your crust for? Um, I would say about 10 to 15 minutes, um, kind of depending on how much liquid your pie is going to have. If it's something like apple, I would probably just do 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but a good 375, um, we'll get that, we'll get that crust nice and golden. -y. You just want it to look, um, not so much golden brown, but you just want it to look not wet. Yeah. So, um, the bottom of your pie crust, when you lift up that baking paper should just look dry. Um, if you are doing something, um, like pumpkin or something, mm -hmm. and it's going to bake for a long time after that. If you do want to put some aluminum foil, or now they make these cute little silicone um, kind of crust guards that you can put over your pie. Yes. Um, those are great for protecting your edges. If you know the pie is going to keep baking for a long time, and mm -hmm. you don't want the pie to get um, the edges to get too dark. Yeah, those are great. Yeah, tin foil is your friend. Um, your best friend. <laughs> so I saw this is a similar to what we've already talked about. Um, Beth was talking about she, very similar to the cereal that you were talking about. 
um, she saw a, um, a recipe that said they put a layer of ground almonds on the bottom crust Ooh. and then you add the apple filling. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, do you think almonds would kind of serve the same purpose as the cereal in terms of absorbing the liquid? I mean, I just think that would be delicious anyway, even if it didn't. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I don't know how absorbent nuts are. I don't think that would absorb too much, but maybe almond flour, um, just because mm. it's so um, fine, you know, the grain of it is so fine, fine yeah. that it would kind of solidify with the liquid. Um, but even a lot of the times, like I'll use some almond flour in my crust. Um, you know, I'll substitute 25% of my flour for a nut flour. Mm. Um, and it just makes it so much yummier. You know, it just gives it a little complexity that you wouldn't expect. Um, but something like hazelnuts, you know, people will take a bite of that pie and be like, what is that? Oh, oh, that's a hazelnut in there. Yeah. That's yeah. delicious. Yeah. Um, Jennifer in New Hampshire would like to know what's the best way to keep leftover pie. Oh, this is such a great question. Yes. In the best possible condition. Is there a way to avoid sogginess in the crust for leftovers? And she's thinking specifically lemon meringue, which is a family staple in my Thanksgiving house. So yes. Uh, how can we avoid that sogginess the next day? So what I find with pies is I'm, I'm a real freak about food safety. So I'm all about mm. holding pies in the safest way. Um, a cooked fruit pie, such as an apple pie, you can leave out at room temperature. So if I cook my apple pie, I'll wrap it with some saran wrap. I'll leave it on my counter. Um, and then we can eat it usually gone by, you know, two or three right. days at the max. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, something like pumpkin pie is actually a baked custard. So there is right. egg in it and there is dairy in there. So I would put it in the fridge. Um, something like app, or, I'm sorry, the pumpkin pie that you wouldn't want a soggy bottom. Um, I would warm up in the oven. So if I had some pumpkin pie left over, it was in my fridge, feeling kind of saucy on a Tuesday night. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I want some leftover pumpkin pie. Um, I'd put my oven on and then I'd warm up the pie in the oven. And that would just kind of, um, you know, pull any of that extra excess liquid out um, and make it taste like you just baked it. As far as lemon meringue pie goes, that's mm. tricky because it is a fruit curd. So you right. would want to keep it in the fridge. Um, but with the meringue, meringue is so um, delicate that yeah. I wouldn't want to bake it again. Um, and, and the longer it sits, it does kind of break down a little bit. Meringue is egg whites that you're pushing air into um, and then hot sugar is coating the bubble and then drying as you whip it. So a lot of the times, you know, meringue will look so beautiful and fluffy and soft and glossy. And then, um, you know, a couple of days and it gets kind of spongy and bubbles, but that's just from, you know, some of the air bubbles popping. So I would say pop it in your fridge um, or eat the entire thing immediately. Um, but you can either try to warm it up in the oven just a little, little bit. I wouldn't go too hard, but um, yeah, I wouldn't hang on to that pie too long. No, you heard it. Because of the first. meringue. Eat yeah. The lemon meringue <laughs> pie, all in one sitting. Portion control to the window. Just exactly. do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stacy would like to know, uh, lately my crusts have been shrinking when they bake. What, what mm. might be my issue? Your issue is not letting your pie crust rest. So mm. when you roll out your pie crust, if you think of a circle of your pie crust, when I roll, I roll up and down, left and right. Then I turn my yes. pie crust up and down, left and right. So that way you're forming your gluten in even strands. You don't wanna overwork it and create a ton of gluten, but just by rolling it, you're making a little bit. Um, so when you roll and roll and roll, um, stop and let it rest for a little while. Um, and then, you know, it'll, it'll shrink back a little bit as you're rolling, you let it rest, you pop it in your um, pie pan and you can crimp and dock and stuff. Um, but again, freeze it. Um, once it's in your mm -hmm. pie crust and it's ready to go, get it nice and cold again, and then it won't shrink. Yeah. That's a, that's a great thing. You know, we, we need to rest. A pie dogs yes. need to rest. Yes. And before. that butter needs to get cold again. That butter needs to get nice and cold so that um, it'll make those layers instead of just kind of melting and shrinking. Mm. That was me being the butter. <laughs> Got it. You did, that was really good charades. 
Um, Wendy would like to know, how long do you keep uh, in the freezer after you've put it in the pan and crimped the edges? Great segue question, Wendy. Yes, because it's so thin, you know, when you roll it out, I only do a couple of minutes, 10, 15 minutes max. Great. Um, <laughs> this is a great question by Louise. Um, what's the best tool or body part for mixing pie crust? Does it depend on what the fat being used is? Mm, so a lot of people um, and a lot of recipes that you see online will say use a food processor because mm -hmm. it's not your hands touching butter because you want everything as cold as humanly possible. Right. Um, and your hands give off a lot of warmth. Um, a lot of people will use the pastry cutter that um, it's kind of like four very oh, small the, little blades. Yeah, that you yeah, use yeah. By, like yes. Mm -hmm. um, some people use a fork and, and, you know, fork the flour and the butter in there together. I like to use my electric mixer um, on low, um, but that way my hands aren't in it. Um, and then I'm using the mixer to push that butter into the flour um, so that it, you know, is staying nice and cool because my hands, the only trick with that is you gotta keep a good eye on it. If you let that go a little too long, you immediately have this big ball of dough. All of your butter lumps have disappeared um, and you really want it to be, this shaggy mass right. that has big visible chunks of butter when you're done. So when I get to that point, I turn my mixer off immediately and I, you know, pour it out on my flour counter. I just press that together with my hands really quick. Um, and then I form that puck so right. that I can pop it in the fridge before I roll it. Right. So when you're, um, when you're using your mixer, do you use your paddle attachment? Do you use the, the whisk or anything in particular? paddle. I definitely use my paddle attachment. Um, I would use my whisk if I wanted to aerate something or push air into it, you know, right. make my whipped cream for on top of my pie. Right. Um, but the paddle will just um, incorporate, well, we'll, we'll get that um, butter flattened down um, into nice little pea sized slash right. marble sized bits. Yeah. Speaking of the butter too. So I've seen some recipes, it, it kind of depends on what medium you're making the dough with where mm -hmm. um, some you'll cut into you know like quarter inch cubes mm -hmm. I've seen some recipes where you use a box grater mm -hmm. um, or some that are you know a little bit of both would you want to adjust how you're cutting up that butter um, depending on what medium you're mixing with because if you're mixing with a fork and you just have you know tablespoons right. of butter I imagine that would be exhausting right <laughs> Yes. So um, I definitely cube it um, into something marble sized. Yeah. Uh, so that way you're not overworking it too. You know, if you're throwing an entire stick of butter in there and then you're letting it mix, you're incorporating a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of mixing in there. Um, that's unnecessary. If you cube it up, um, it'll just need to mix a little bit until you see those marble size, pea mm -hmm. size pieces that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Riva who would like to know, when I roll out my pie crust, it's often dry. Why and what am I doing wrong? Um, so a lot of the time um, when you are mixing your pie crust, you have your flour and your salt. Um, you put your butter in there and then you're adding that water at the end. So a lot of the times people panic with the water. Um, you want to have enough that it comes together um, but a lot of people look for this shaggy mass that are, are all these recipes say shaggy mass, mm -hmm. shaggy mass, um, that still has some, some dry bits, um, but you just need to add enough water that it'll come together. Right. So then when you pour out your dough onto the counter and you start to form it with your hands, you can make that puck. Um, if it's still kind of crumbling, if there's tons of flour left over, put a little more water in there, um, and then roll it out again and you're good. Yeah. It's so scary with the water because it'll say, oh, you know, two to 10 tablespoons. I know. will give you this range. And it's, it's really all by eye. You add one tablespoon at a time, watch it go around. And as soon as it hits that sweet spot of just coming together, that's when you stop it. Especially since some recipes are like, oh, well, depending on your altitude, yeah, you, might of course. Like, <laughs> you might have more humidity if you're in a humid kitchen, if you're in a dry yes. kitchen and you're like, where am I? 
I don't know. If it's if it's a Wednesday, add three tablespoons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're all so specific. It's truly just like watching it, and you know, yeah, and getting your feel. And if you get a crappy pie crust, I mean, it'll probably still taste good, even if it shrinks. <laughs> Oh, like, absolutely. It's butter. Fine. How is it not going to taste good? Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, Diane has a great question. What are your favorite apples to use for an apple pie? Ooh, so I love apples. I love apple picking. I feel like I'm that person that will get like one of every kind and take a bite of every one and be like, hmm, I don't know about this one or, oh, I like this one. Mm. So I love a honey crisp. Honey crisp Ooh, is my yes, favorite so apple. It has, you know, that tart flavor. Um, that like exciting bite when you, but when you bite into it, it holds up really well in pies. Um, I feel like a golden delicious um, or, you know, it just kind of turns to mush. Yeah. Like I would use that for like an applesauce or like something that I would want the apples to break down a little more. Mm -hmm. um, tons of people go straight Granny Smith because yeah. you want that super sour tart feeling or taste, but um, they do hold up really well too. You get you know, when you cut the pie, you still have the slices intact. I find that Honeycrisp holds up, but it'll still soften nicely. Um, but it just has that delicious, sweet flavor when it's baked. It's the perfect apple. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You see that most baking recipes will call for mm -hmm. a, a Granny Smith, but a Honeycrisp is like a nice, yeah. like mellower version. Yeah. Um, and it's still not too sweet when you mix the other sugars and everything with it. It's, it's still good. Right. I feel like a red delicious is, you know, I'm sitting at a desk and I'm eating an apple. It's, a, it's, it's nothing. It's water. I feel like honey crisp has a delicious bright flavor. I should be the spokesperson for honey crisp apples. I could not, I can't stop saying enough good things. <laughs> they are, they are so good. They're so much better than regular apples. I, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, Dana has a question about fats in, um, in pies. So butter, Crisco or a combination? So the perfect combination I would say is half and half or 25% Crisco shortening and 75% mm. butter. Mm. I'm a huge advocate for butter, butter. I think everything is better with butter. Uh, I think butter is better with butter, yes, um, but the shortening does give you the beautiful flaky texture that everybody likes in a pie crust. Mm. Um, but like your butter and how you have your butter cold, keep your shortening cold as well. Pop it in the fridge as well. Um, so that when you do mix the two together and you mix it into your pie crust, those layers are also nice and cold and will make that nice um, steam and the different layers. Great. Um, Sarah would like to know what's the difference between par baking and pre baking. So pre baking, you are baking your crust all the way. Um, mm -hmm. You are doing it. Um, you're baking your pie crust with the pie weights or the beans in there so that it's fully done and ready to be filled. A lot of the time, if I'm making um, like a chocolate cream pie, for example, I'll bake my crust all of the way. Um, usually, I'll do the pie weights just until it's about done. Then I'll pull them out just to get that nice golden brown right on the bottom. And then I'll get some melted white chocolate or, um, you know, if I'm doing chocolate pie, I'll do some melted chocolate chips or something right. and I'll brush the sides of the pie. And that also helps you to keep the pie crust yeah. crisp. You'll have that barrier between your chocolate custard and or your chocolate pastry cream and the crust. Um, par baking is when you partially bake your crust. It just kind of takes the edge off. It gets your crust starting to bake and starting to evaporate some of that liquid and make those layers. So then when you add the filling and then you continue baking, um, it'll be baked, fully baked all the way around at the same time your filling is done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like by baking is just like, how can we waterproof naturally? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, no. um, thank you everyone for your questions. Um, we are just going to take a quick break um, and I'm going to introduce my colleague, Sandy, who has some words for us. Welcome, Sandy. Hi, Gina. Thank you so much. I'm learning so much from this. 
I al already made a note to go ahead and get a glass pie baking dish. And I hope you are enjoying today's event and all the tips and tricks that we're hearing here. And just like eating a pie, there's something so warm and comforting to be with a community of people brought together by their love of holiday baking. And GBH strives to give audiences the best in entertainment and experiences like today. And the best way to give back to GBH is by signing up as a sustainer. When you give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, and that's just $60 for the whole year, you will receive as a thank you gift these limited edition Great British Baking Show double oven mitts. And I think we've heard a love of Great British Baking Show here already. Oh, and you yeah. can see it already gives you the inspiration with the words ready bake. And giving is so easy. Please go to gbh.org slash support events or simply click on that link that you'll see in the chat tab and contribute what you can. You can also text GBH to 800-204-3811 or go ahead and scan the QR code located right here on your screen. Pick a monthly amount that works for you and your budget. It's automatically deducted from your bank account or charge on your credit card. It's that easy. And you can change the amount anytime. So thank you so much for listening. And now back to Gina and with more of your questions for Sarah. I can't wait. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, I would gladly become a sustainer for those oven mitts. I am <laughs> a <laughs> huge Great British Baking Show fan with oh, yeah. new, new episode on tonight, by the way, final <laughs> four for anyone who's watching. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds like a really great gift. So let's uh, get back to your questions. Um, wow, we have so many. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> Kathy would like to know, how do you prevent a pre-baked crust from collapsing? A pre-baked crust? How do you collapsing? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thing with a crust is you have to remember it's a vessel. It's, it's made to hold filling, especially something you know, like a banana cream pie. You are filling that thing with custard, with bananas, with custard, it's very heavy. So when you do crust, it's really important to pay attention to the thickness you make it. Um, when you roll out a pie crust, a lot of times people um, get a little heavy handed towards one edge and then the other side is very mm -hmm. thick. So like I was saying before, when you roll up and down and then side to side, then you put your rolling pin down, spin the dough on your counter, roll up and down, roll side to side, spin the dough. And then I like to take my fingers and go around all of the edges and just kind of feel um, to see if the thickness is even all the way around. And I think a lot of the times people are thinking, oh, I don't wanna make it too thick because then it'll never bake all the way through. Um, if I keep it really thin, it'll bake all the way through, but it's gonna hold a lot of stuff. So it really needs to have a little bit of width to it. So. I usually recommend maybe like a quarter of an inch ish thing. Mm -hmm. Bless you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and it really will hold hold a good amount of filling. So it's all about the thickness. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great tip. So also, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Also, with the um, if you are doing a cream pie, that um, melted chocolate that I was telling you about that you brush with, that'll also make it much stronger. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, you're fine. <laughs> I love that tip. I made a chocolate pie recently and that really would have just kind of like amped it up even yeah. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Oh, this is a great question. So um, maybe not always pie, but you know, sometimes with pies, you'll see graham cracker crust, Oreo mm -hmm. cookie crust. Um, so Christine would like to know, why did my press in Oreo cookie crust shrink when I baked it? I didn't know that was even a thing. <laughs> yes, oh, crumb crusts are so tricky, but if you learn if you learn this trick, it is so helpful, flawless. Mm. So a lot of the times, no matter what crumb you're doing, if you're doing ginger snap, graham cracker, Oreo, whatever, right. um, you get your crumbs, you add a little bit of brown sugar, whatever the recipe calls for, and then you know it'll say one cup of melted butter. Don't listen to that. Get your melted butter. I um, slowly pour it in there and toss all of the things together, mm -hmm. your um, brown sugar and your crust. Um, slowly add a little more butter. And then if you grab two big handfuls of the crust and squeeze it, if it holds the shape of your hands, it's done. Mm. Um, a lot of the times, all of these recipes will add too much butter. If you have too much butter, that's why you're getting shrinkage. It's all melting down. So I would do the crumbs, 
the brown sugar and just add melted butter until when you squeeze it with your hands, it stays in that shape and then you're perfect. So you're almost treating the butter in this instance like you do the water when you're yes. making a flour pie dough, but you just want to add it like tablespoon at a time. Yes, it's so all it's by eye and, and by feel. So much of baking is so tricky because it is all by eye and all by feel, you know, pulling a yeah. cake out of the oven and just touching the top and making sure it springs back. It's very hands-on kind of hobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Shelly who would like to know for cherry pie, do you need to use fresh pitted cherries or can you use frozen cherries or would frozen cause too much oozing? And I think that's a great question for most fruit pies. You know, mm -hmm. it's, typically cheaper to buy frozen berries. Mm -hmm. um, they're plentiful. If they're not in season, you can still make a mixed berry pie. So um, what's what's the uh, recommendation for using fresh versus frozen fruit? I'm all about frozen fruit. Like you just said, it's so much cheaper. Um, yeah. It's always available. A lot of the times, um, you know, you'll want, you'll need a blueberry pie or a cherry pie when it's not cherry season, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I'm all about frozen fruit. A lot of the time, um, you're right, it does give off a little bit more liquid. So sometimes what I do is I'll get, you know, frozen cherries, I'll pop them in a bowl and I'll put them in my fridge and I'll let them thaw hmm. um, and just kind of drain out that little bit of excess liquid yeah. that it that comes out. That way, when you add all of your sugars and stuff like that, you're not drowning in cherry juice. So by all means, go frozen, save yourself, you know, the extra expense, but just thaw them first. That's that's a great question and a great way to, you know, like, I'm not a big fan of the traditional like pumpkin fall mm -hmm. pies, uh, mm -hmm. but I love a strawberry rhubarb pie. So oh, yeah. um, I would love to get that all year round. Thank you very much. So yep. frozen it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another question we have uh, similar to the par baking. So we talked about using rice or beans. Mm -hmm. Um, and Susan wants to know if you, uh, once you put in the rice or the beans and you do your pre-baking, can you still use that rice and beans or do you need to pitch them? Um, so I, I want to say you could still use them, but honestly, what I do is I have one container of dry beans that I just use year after year after year. Mm -hmm. I have a little, you know, glass mason jar. I put the beans in there and then I write baking beans and then you can use it the next year and the next year and the next year. Um, I would think with the rice, it would probably toast the rice a little bit. Um, yeah. Beans, I think you'd probably be fine. I'm not, not hundred percent sure on that one, but um, yeah, by all means, just save them because next year, you know, you're going to need them again. Right. Also a little toasted rice in a soup. That sounds delicious. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm there for it. <laughs> um, we have TJ from Cape Cod and TJ wants to know, which flour is best for pie pockets or hand pies? Um, I find that the crust is too flaky. It opens up and the filling spills out during baking. Mm. So that could also be from some shrinkage. Mm. Um, for pie crust, you can do a pastry flour um, or I would do an all-purpose flour. I feel like all-purpose gives you a little bit of that strength that you need for you know, holding a lot of filling and um, you know, being stable enough to have tons of apples, but then for a hand pie, people pick up and bite. Um, but all purpose is half bread flour and half pastry flour. So you get the softness um, from a pastry flour, but you get the strength from the bread flour. So I would go all, I would go all purpose. Yeah, that's great. Um, we have another question. Ooh. The question I was going to ask disappeared. Um, <laughs> but speaking of, uh, ah, there it is. Um, how about nut crust? So we talked a little bit about um, graham cracker crust or Oreo cookie crust. Um, there was a great cranberry pie with a hazelnut crust that Louise had. Any tips on creating or baking those? Oof, that sounds delicious. Um, yes. A lot of nut flours, I usually do a little bit of flour and the nut flour just to give it a little more stability. But if you're doing um, nut flour instead of like a graham cracker or something like that, um, again, I would do enough butter so that when you squeeze it with your hand, it holds its shape. That way, when you go to press it into your um, pie pan, um, 
you know, it holds up and it doesn't shrink down. Did I answer that question? Did I answer the question? I think so, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. Just <laughs> want to make sure. <laughs> um, we've had a couple of folks ask questions. It's, it's been in one or two places yeah. um, about adding vinegar or egg to your pie crust. Um, have you seen any recipes that call for that? And what would be the intention of, of the vinegar? Um, so I've definitely seen egg um, and I've seen vinegar a little bit. So I think with the, with the egg for sure, a lot of people use, you know, one egg in their pie crust max just to give it a little bit more flavor, color, um, and a little bit more oomph. Uh, with pie crust, you can say it's kind of a, a short dough so that it um, it's flaky. You can cut it with the side of your fork. It kind of breaks or, um, you know, flakes. Um, egg would make it a little more, I don't want to say chewy because I don't want to give off. It'll just give it a little bit more bite. Mm. Um, egg would incorporate a little more protein into there and fat into the crust um, and make it a little bit thicker. So by all means, add an egg in there. It's, it's a great idea. Um, I've done egg a lot with, um, you know, if I'm doing something a little bit more savory, um, and egg also, you know, by all means, egg wash your crust. If you're doing a lattice top or something yeah. like that, if you brush with egg, um, I usually do one egg and then a tablespoon of water, um, or you can do a tablespoon of milk, totally up to you. Um, and you just whisk it with a fork or a little whisk and then mm -hmm. um, use that. And then the egg wash not only gives this beautiful color, um, but it'll also give you the shine because of the protein right. in the egg. Um, and it'll give you a nice sticky surface for when you sprinkle all that cinnamon sugar yes. or the, you know, the coarse sanding sugar, everything will stick on your pie. Mm -hmm. Love to put that coarse sugar on top of my pie. <sighs> Yeah, it makes the pie. You know, it's that bite where you get that little bit of the gritty sugar that's just the best bite of the whole pie. Mm -hmm. So um, Steph would like to know, sometimes I find crust recipes a little bland. Are there any recommendations on making it a little less blah? Ooh, um, listen, absolutely. Pie crust is, is so simple. You know, flour, salt, butter, water, done. That's it. Um, so by all means, get nuts. Uh, whenever I'm doing something with, with flour that I want to make chocolate that isn't, um, usually I do like rule of thumb, like 25%. So like a quarter of it, take out the flour and substitute with cocoa powder. So if you wanted to do, um, a pecan pie, but make a chocolate crust, um, mm -hmm. you can do that, something like that. Um, I've also added some chocolate into the, um, pecan pie filling or like a little instant um, espresso. So it has yeah. like this little like bite of coffee. Um, a lot of the times you can add spices or herbs into your crust. That's kind of fun. Um, again, if you're doing the savory route, you wanna add some thyme in there. Um, mm. That's like a fun option. Um, and spices, you know, add a little bit of cinnamon into your crust or um, a, just a tiny whiny bit of nutmeg. Um, just gives you like a little bit more bite to it, which is fun. Yeah. Um, we have some questions about thickeners. I've seen it in a few mm -hmm. places. So mm -hmm. when you're trying to thicken, uh, you know, adding a little bit of thickness to a fruit pie, namely, um, do you like to use cornstarch, tapioca, arrowroot, flour, anything in particular that's your go-to or might be better than something else? Um, I think as long as you follow the recipe, um, with the ratio of your slurry, you're fine. So a slurry would be, um, for example, with the corn starch, um, you add corn starch and a liquid, and then that will um, cr create your gelling agent. So mm -hmm. corn starch is a gelling agent that would be your thickener. Um, so a lot of the times if your pie has lemon juice in it, that would be the liquid that would get your corn starch activated. Um, they're all pretty interchangeable. It's not like cornstarch or tapioca gives any sort of flavor or anything like that. Um, I find that cornstarch is usually the strongest, um, but a lot of people who don't usually have those things on hand will just use flour, which is absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, so we've got a little bit of time left. So we're gonna go to rapid fire questions. Great. Lightning round. Okay. <laughs> 
Salted butter or unsalted butter in your dough? Unsalted. Always bake with unsalted. Always bake with unsalted. Your recipe will have salt that you add in there. Always bake with unsalted. Absolutely. Um, would you recommend pre-cooking your apples to avoid the gap issue? Um, not if you get your slices thin enough. If you're one of the people that likes to um, dice up your apple into like little chunks or cubes, Cook it down a little bit, but if you were the thin slice kind of person, you're fine baking it as usual. Can you tell us your pie recipe one more time? Sure. It is three, two, one pie dough. So usually I do six ounces of flour, four ounces of butter, and two ounces of water. Um, that'll do, you know, the bottom. I usually double it if I'm going to do a bottom crust and a top right. crust. I like to have a little bit, obviously, for decorations. Um, so yeah, six ounces, four ounces, I'm sorry, six ounces flour, four ounces fat, two ounces water, and double that. Perfect. Uh, possibly the most important question that's been asked this whole time, what is your favorite pie to make and eat? <gasps> Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, my favorite pie to make and eat. I would have to say, wow, what a question. I would have to say my favorite pie to eat is this recipe that was my Nana's. Um, my dad's mom used to make this pie that was a graham cracker crust and then kind of a quick ganache with unsalted, I'm sorry, unsweetened chocolate and sweetened condensed milk. Mm. Oh my God, it is fantastic. It's that and you know, that perfect balance of salty and sweet. Um, and then that rich chocolate. So that's my favorite to eat. Um, my favorite to make would definitely be apple. I feel like most people, you know, think of an apple pie and they're like, this is the most labor intensive thing in the entire world. But I find peeling apples to be the most relaxing thing in the entire world. I could just stand there and peel apples for hours. Um, and even doing them on the mandolin and getting those perfect, beautiful slices, you know, layering them so nice in the pie. And then it gives you so much versatility for decorations on the top with the pie. Um, you know, I love to use cookie cutters, stuff like that to make fun decorations. Love an apple pie. So this is your like peak season. This is when you come alive. Oh, apple God, pie yes. I love the fall. <laughs> Anytime I can use cinnamon and everything, it's golden. Actually, your grandma's pie sounds similar to, since I'm not a big pie fan, my grandmother would always make me, she'd buy graham cracker crusts and put like instant chocolate pudding in them. Yeah. And they were like yeah. <laughs> my favorite thing in the entire world. And she basically made them for me up until I was like 27. And I'm like, grandma, I'm an adult now, but I'm still going to eat these, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you'll make them for people forever. Yeah. <laughs> They're delicious. Um, so we have pumpkin pie. The recipe doesn't say to pre-bake the crust. Would it make the bottom crispier? Any suggestions for the baking time? Um, I would say it wouldn't necessarily make your crust crispier, but it would definitely um, make you not have the layer of, so pretend this is your pie slice as you take it out. This is the crust on the edge of the pie and this is the bottom. With pumpkin pie, you always see the crust you know, the pumpkin custard. And then there's always that line of the like kind of raw dough. Yeah. Um, it would eliminate that. Mm. Yeah, definitely know yeah. what that is. Yes. You mentioned that you use glass pie dishes for par baking to see the bake on the bottom. But do you adjust the temperature for the bake while you're using a glass pie dish? Um, I don't adjust the temperature because it's glass, no. Um, and with the par baking, I... Pre-baking or par-baking? Uh, this is par-baking. Par-baking. So par-baking, when you're looking for if it's par-baked, it's not necessarily the bottom that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. It's the inside of the cake. It's the interior. So when you take out your pie weights, when you pick up the parchment and take out those pie weights and you look at the bottom, it should just look dry. Um, if it's still kind of wet or greasy looking, let it go a couple more minutes. You just want to start the crust baking. You don't want to go too far um, or look for any color at that point. You're just trying to dry it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, this is this is another great question from Marge that we see all the time. How do you prevent a crust from tearing when you roll it out? Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the time, again, it's the moisture level. When you add that water in, you want to make sure the dough has enough liquid to stay together. 
um, a lot of the times when people, you know, roll the pie and start putting it in the crust, I'm sorry, in the pan, it'll rip as they're pressing it on the sides and then they'll panic. Don't panic. Pie crust is one of the most forgiving things in the entire world. If you tear a little bit on the edge, take a little bit of the excess and press it in there. You'll be totally fine. Um, when you have your pie pan mm -hmm. and your crust is in there and it goes a little bit over, right? I usually look for maybe half an inch overhang. And then what I find works great is even if you have to rip and piece together, as long as you have that half an inch on the side yeah. and you tuck it underneath. Yeah. So if this is the pie crust and you tuck it underneath, it gives you this nice, even thickness. And then this is what you would crimp all the way around. That's yeah. the best way to crimp. Yeah, it gives you nice meat for crimping, which is, yes. which is good. Yeah, and then everything's nice and even too. You know, you don't have a tiny, whiny bit that's so thin on one side and then, you know, this thick glob on the other side. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are gonna take another quick pause right here because Sandy wants to get back in the conversation. So uh, Sandy, I'd love to bring you back on. Thank you so much. This has been such a fun event. I am going to be waiting for the recording of this event and playing it back probably a number of times. And I hope you are having had a great time today as well. We rely on financial support from audiences and members to keep offering programs and virtual events like this one. So if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, we'll send you these limited edition Ready Bake Great British Baking Show double oven mitt as our thank you gift. Please go ahead and visit gbh.org slash support events to make a donation. You can also click on the chat link in the tab to be brought to our secure site or text GBH to 800-204-3811. Thanks for spending this time with us and thank you moreover for your support. It's lunchtime too, so I think instead of a sandwich, I'm going to go make some pie. But have a happy holiday season and enjoy making those pies. Back to you, Gina. Great. Thanks, Sandy. Yes, I agree. It is pie time, not lunchtime. It's pie time. So we're uh, near the end of our time together. And I just have one final question for you, which is there are so many things happening in the kitchen. It's Thanksgiving, you know. Um, but in the words of kitchen goddess Ina Garten, if you can't ah. make it, if you can't make it yourself, store bought is fine. So what are some shortcuts that home bakers can use to make this easier if we can't, you know, mill our own flour or harvest our <laughs> own apples the way Ina might? Um, what are some ways that we can make it a little faster? So this is so funny you mentioned this. So there's this ongoing joke in my family that my grandma makes the best apple pie. And my cousin Matthew would only eat grandma's apple pie. I said, Matthew, I went to the Culinary Institute of America, eat my apple pie. And he goes, no, I only eat grandma's. So one day we said, grandma, what is your secret? What makes your apple pie so good? And she said, I use store-bought crust and then the can of apple filling. And you know what? It yep. is the best apple pie. You know, you can, you can be there growing your own apples in an orchard. And, you know, it's still, it's still not as good as your grandma emptying a can of apple filling into a pie crust that's already bought. <laughs> I mean, so much of eating has to do with just your connection and the emotions right. and everything like that. I mean, like we, we talked about my, I talked about my grandmother's lemon meringue pie. That's like my brother's favorite thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's like my tea fine lemon pudding. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's just like, you know, very basic, but if that's what you grew up with and that's your emotional connection, you know, yeah. you can't beat it. And folks like what they like. Yep. And it's, it's the only time of year that you have pies. You know, we wait all year round to have a pumpkin pie. And then when you get it at your Thanksgiving table, you say, wow, this is the best because you have the entire rest of the year to look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have come to the end of our time. Sarah, thank you so much for spending this hour with us and giving us all of your pie knowledge. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Oh, of course. And um, folks, if you wanna um, follow Sarah on social media, um, her handles are in the chat and I highly recommend it so you can stay in touch and 
take some of her more delicious knowledge. I highly recommend it. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of questions, but thank you for your engagement. You really made this event what it is. Um, you can follow GBH events to learn more about what we have coming up in the future. That's in the chat as well. And thank you for watching. Have a safe and happy and healthy holiday. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Take care. Thanks.